Thanks very much, um, and uh, I'm so excited to be talking after um, Ed and, and Cody's uh, work. Um, maybe, yeah, I'm just full of uh, ideas, and I'm, I'm eager to get to the discussion. But first, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about puppets and robots in uh, the 21st century performance. But before doing that, I want to thank Christian for this invitation and for putting together a really um, thoughtful and integrated uh, and comprehensive uh, program these two days, so thank you. Uh, robots and puppets are linked by a common human impulse, the desire to give life to non-living objects in order to reveal aspects of the human experience. There are also mechanical devices controlled by external forces, and their design is evocative of human and animal forms. Now, in 2013, I completed a dissertation about the relationship uh, and the aesthetics of autonomous and semi-autonomous machines. And in that, I argued that if engineers hoped to build robots uh, in the future that were actually engaging to humans, that they could look to traditional puppetry for innovative design and control solutions. So, rather than building machines that look like this, and we've seen some examples of these uh, geminoids, um, and uh, full disclosure, I worked uh, together in a geminoid lab uh, uh, together with uh, Henrik Schaffa uh, on my postdoc. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with this, and I think that there's a lot of advantage of these, uh, working with these types of robots. Um, but there's another approach. So rather than make machines that look like this, we could also uh, think uh, from an engineering perspective um, about the aesthetics and control techniques of puppetry. So that we could... Oh, There we go. Uh, maybe approach the design of robots uh, from something like this. Now, in general, puppets are more flexible. They're more dynamic and, on the whole, I think more visually appealing than robots. As Heinrich von Kleist pointed out in his essay, they're also capable of extremely delicate and nuanced movements. Over centuries, puppet puppeteers have perfected their art, and this insight, I believe, holds tremendous value to roboticists. The abstraction inherent to puppetry, its deep focus on movement and material, and we've heard a lot about the importance of uh, material and on behavior and on, on affect uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, this would lead to creative robots that people actually want to interact with, and I think that are more uh, nimble and expressive. Furthermore, puppets evoke agency and autonomy in a similar way as robots. Whether or not we can see the human puppeteer guiding the motions, puppets invite the spectator to adopt a kind of phenomenal double vision. We know the object is not alive, and yet we are momentarily willing to grant it a life, or at least a special kind of life. A puppet does not inherently have agency, rather agency is evoked through performance, through the dynamic interplay between puppeteer, performing object, and the audience. An autonomous robot, on the other hand, unlike a puppet, is usually designed to perform independently from the human programmer. Even in situations where the robot is teleoperated by a human operator, uh, for example via remote control, its ontological status as a functional machine encourages the spectator to adopt a similar phenomenal gaze. South African puppeteer Basil Jones has suggested that the puppet's struggle for life is the ur narrative that underlies all puppetry. We might extend this struggle to robots, artistic or otherwise. The ur narrative autonom of autonomous robots is the struggle to demonstrate autonomy and prove, on some level, their liveness. This struggle for life is the paradox of puppets and robots, articulated so well by scholars Gadini and Bergamasco. They write, and I'll let you read it, but the key point here uh, is the ontological status of uh, robots and, and puppets. And this paradox uh, that um, can take place, they say, in our technologically saturated environment as entities that simultaneously occlude and expose their artificiality. This is this double vision or the paradox of the binary vision um, that I'm, I'm interested in. Now, in the last few years since uh, completing my dissertation when everyone said, robots and theater, what? What are you talking about? Uh, I've watched a proliferation of theater artists, uh, both in the avant-garde and in the commercial uh, performance scene, incorporate robots and computational systems into live performance. Robots increasingly appear on theater stages, as we've seen countless examples in the previous uh, presentations here and uh, yesterday. 
and they perform characters alongside human actors and other robots. Apart from their theatrical value, these performances continue the tradition, I believe, of public scientific demonstrations uh, that began in the 17th century. When programmed automata delighted audiences by emulating human behaviors, such as playing music, drawing, smoking, and even uh, purportedly playing chess. During the Tokugawa era in Japan, theater audiences flocked to bunraku, traditional Japanese puppet playhouses, to marvel at the articulated human puppets uh, that poured tea, threaded needles, and played musical instruments in performances that rivaled their human counterparts in kabuki theater. Now, from early experiments with robotics arts uh, during the 1960s, all of a sudden we have automata being replaced by programmed computers with sensors. And I'm, I, I realize that I'm jumping over a huge bit of history here um, to make this connection between, uh, between uh, puppetry and, and robotics. Um, but contemporary robots on stage utilize uh, now computational control rather than pure automation, including motion plan and algorithms with real-time sensing and actuation. More than mere technological marvels, robots on stage have proved tractable research platforms for designing and controlling robots, uh, and as Ed mentioned, also for studying human-robot interaction. Uh, they also challenge the very definition of puppet while exploring the artistic potential of computational creativity. This includes works like uh, Annie Dorson's staging of Hello, Hi There, performed by two live chatbots, uh, and real-time text-to-speech engines that reprise and restage the televised debates between uh, Foucault and Noam Chomsky. To Elizabeth Merriweather's playful adaptation of Hedda Gobbler, uh, Hedatron, that featured a human protagonist surrounded by a cornucopia of vaguely anthropomorphic uh, household appliances. To Todd Macover's Death and the Powers, a musical opera that featured a chorus of autonomous uh, opera bots that were able to uh, navigate uh, the stage independently and, and, and coordinate. Alongside these and other experimental theater performances, I've also observed a trend in scientific researchers who are incorporating theater, dance, and other live performance practices into their experiments and laboratories. Um, and there are a lot of these uh, examples. Uh, this is a... Um, one of the uh, most uh, sophisticated, uh, uh, intelligent robots uh, here on the left, uh, Herb, um, from uh, Cornell Laboratory. Um, and uh, uh, up here we've got the PR2 uh, from Willow Barrage, and uh, down here my own uh, experiments uh, together with human-robot interaction and social robots. Uh, I also have used performances and live art gallery settings to conduct research on how humans perceive robots my own research uh, joins these attempts and in an effort to, to prove that art and performance are robust research environments. And this is the subject of my talk later tonight um, at the uh, American Center of the Embassy. So live theater has become a site for uh, designing innovative control solutions for timing, improvisation, and demonstrating speech synthesis and also for exploring more human-centered concerns such as uh, caregiving and robot companionship in the scripted dramas uh, Sayonara and I Worker, which uh, we've already, um, uh, have already been touched on here. But programming robots to give mechanical performances uh, in this regard is a rather straightforward engineering task. Right? It's, um, it's, it's largely solvable. It's a, a direct uh, operation and articulation, direct programming uh, of the motions, and, and executed in real time. Uh, this is a, a this is just a, another mediated form of direct puppetry. But in these cases, there's no human artistry or intention powering the motions. The resulting movements invariably look mechanical or rigid. The limitation is largely a function of robot design and material, and the humanoid robots, uh, such as the Geminoid here. Uh, individual motors and pneumatics mechanically reproduce the functional movement of humans or human-like bodies, and the resulting movements almost always appear rigid or jerky, regardless of whether it is controlled by a computer or by a live human puppeteer. So it can't get past its mechanicalness. We can think of this as a kinematic version of the uncanny valley, where robots cannot ever communicate any artistic truths other than mechanical ones. For example, compare the grace. Uh, oh, let's get this. Compare uh, the grace and agility of. I'm going to do this on the computer. Uh, these puppets. 
from the, uh, we don't need the sound for this, uh, from the Salzburg Marionette Theater with the choreographed now uh, robots dancing. So you see, we miss this kind of ease and uh, grace and nuance. And, and one could argue that it might be because of the, uh, because of the sort of human intention entering, uh, as Kleist said, into the gravity of the marionette, right? The sort of puppeteer lending its uh, and, and their um, performance energy into it. Um, but I really think it has to do more with the mechanical design and control. So we've talked a lot about material and heard a lot about material in the last couple of days, and uh, I, this is a well-known fact. It was so delightful to hear uh, the architects uh, working with robots yesterday um, uh, and, and all the speakers touch on this, this idea of, uh, um, it's a well-known design principle, right, that motion reveals material. So if we're going to help robots escape what I call this design trap of mechanical motion, uh, we can look back to puppetry, not just as a metaphor of objects that emulate uh, the human form and condition, but as functional teachers of how to work with material and design motion and control techniques uh, that are capable of nuanced performances. Uh, and this is where I think the influence of puppetry on robotic art and performance is not just historical, uh, but it's fundamental to creating and designing robots. Uh, so this, somehow my slides got out of order, but this is the one I wanted to show with this. The field of puppetry has a long and rich history of generating expressive motion with relatively simple control mechanisms, uh, largely under-actuated systems. Puppets can be controlled through direct control by human operators or autonomously using sequenced pre-programmed animations or some combination of the two. Now, puppeteers have learned how to use and, and transform these design constraints, such as limited degrees of freedom and imprecise control, to their advantage. A puppet's primary purpose is movement, and marionette puppetry in particular relies on carefully controlled sequences of movements by a human operator to control the highly dynamic motions uh, of, the body with, uh, of the puppet body with many degrees of freedom. And this, was, uh, this is where my interest in robots started, was with um, uh, this uh, project I did uh, together with uh, the Neuroscience and Robotics Lab at Northwestern and uh, Georgia Tech and Disney, uh, where basically uh, we've designed a uh, hardware and uh, customized software uh, for motion trajectories to control the movements of a marionette. Uh, controlling these motions are <laughs> uh, is a quite a complex task uh, from an engineering perspective, but something that a human operator does uh, quite intuitively. So in the time uh, that remains, I'm going to show you some works that I do, some works for the, the stage that I think do a wonderful job of applying principles of puppetry to robotics. Uh, the works are by artists in Denmark, Australia, America, Singapore, and together they illustrate innovative and sometimes unexpected approaches to the design and control of entertainment robots. So the first piece I'll talk about is a piece called The Future by a, a neat theater company I'm working together with in Copenhagen, Leuven de Griesen. Uh, and I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, and I know there are people in the audience who know I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> the Flying Pigs. Uh, and the, the production is called The Future. Uh, it featured two industrial, high payload cuckoo robots that portrayed a number of characters alongside a human actor. It was uh, performed and scripted in Danish, and the full-length play features nearly 20 characters and a variety of loosely collected plot lines that depict a future of world space tourism, nuclear disaster containment, and geopolitical crisis, mediated by surveillance technologies and drone warfare. The robots perform a variety of animate and inanimate roles alongside actor Thomas Cornelison. The robots are obviously not remotely, remotely anthropomorphic, uh, and on stage, they communicate principally through choreography, although sometimes, and we'll see an example of this, there are some voiceovers and, and text. The robots engage uh, and act a range of characters from a small child in a rural African village to a journalist, a personal assistant, and an interrogator. But the production does not ask us to interpret the robots as proxies for human performers, but rather invites us to see them, like puppets, as creative performers in their own right. 
And I've got a few, I'll just, we'll look at three short scenes to give you an example of the kind of range of motion. So the robots in Fontian are examples of uh, what performance scholar Jennifer Parker Starbuck has called subject technologies. In performance, the robots transcend their status as functional industrial machines and become performers. Furthermore, the use of industrial machines on stage dramatizes the contemporary shift that I've observed in the cultural function of robots, the shift from industrial machines towards uh, robots as social actors. So now for something completely different. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, briefly the work, um, and how much time do I have? You have about 10 minutes. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak briefly about uh, some the work by the Creature Technology Company uh, and their pioneering work uh, combining robotics uh, with uh, animatronics and traditional puppetry. Now, animatronics are typically associated with theme parks and uh, are classic examples of the kind of uh, machines that fall into that kinematic uncanny valley trap. Um, where their rote mechanical motions fail to engage us or, or hold uh, interest. In film and television, uh, where animatronics have typically been used, um, every degree of freedom on the robot is controlled by a separate uh, controller. And filmmakers uh, require multiple takes and, and editing to create performances that last only a few seconds, sometimes only a few frames. 
Uh, in theme parks, animatronics run specific sequences that remain unchanged over time. And uh, it was interesting watching the, um, uh, the presentation on the first night uh, by the, the clockmaker uh, from the astronomical clock here in Prague because watching that uh, movement of the, the disciples coming in, a very kind of simple rotational movement, um, and, and watching the, the appearance of them. I haven't seen it yet live myself, I'll go tomorrow. Um, but this kind of repetitive motion uh, of the, the, them coming in, but because of the, the poses and the characters and the light uh, cast on the, the, the figures of the disciples, um, there's still something so compelling about uh, even that, that mechanical motion. But again, it remains uh, unchanged. We wouldn't necessarily uh, call that a, a, a dynamic performance. It's, it's limited. So um, CTC is, uh, is interested in using live theater, uh, specifically not working in a, a film um, or, or television context, um, but challenging the paradigm of uh, animatronics uh, to create really um, dynamic and nuanced performances. To date, they've built a cast of large-scale animatronics for three live arena shows and uh, stage productions, uh, Walking with the Dinosaurs, How to Train Your Dragon, and a stage musical of uh, King Kong. They've also designed custom customized animatronics for interactive museum exhibitions and other stage productions, including a 26-foot-tall puppet of uh, the Statue of Liberty featured at Radio City Music Hall. Uh, they challenge the assumption of animatronics as dull rote performers by combining traditional puppetry techniques with automation. Their hybrid approach proposes a new paradigm for entertainment robots by integrating the visual aesthetics and control techniques of puppetry with automated and teleoperated control. The robots uh, on stage are not mere entertainments, but they evidence how the creative approaches uh, from the arts and, and traditional puppetry can influence uh, the design and control of robot motion. And uh, uh, technically, we, uh, from a technical perspective, we've articulated what these might be and how they might um, open up new design principles uh, for uh, engineering and, and the design of robots in general. Um, that comes out uh, in a special issue in Robotics and Autonomous Systems um, on Computational Creativity. So uh, we'll have a look at what this actually looks like uh, on stage. And this is a rehearsal, so you've got kind of a, a digital or pre-visualization overlay of the projections. Uh, you also have a camera up here on the, the side that uh, shows you the kind of rotation controlling the gross um, motion. So the proxemic movements of the uh, robot are controlled um, uh, by, through actuation. And the smaller gestural movements uh, are controlled um, either through teleoperation or through live uh, manipulation. So the Kong robot is an extraordinarily sophisticated puppet. Uh, it's six meters tall, it weighs 1.1 tons, it contains 200 meters of electric cable, 16 microprocessors, 15 servo motors, pneumatic air muscles, and an onboard hydraulic power system and cooling pump. Um, this, is, this is the most uh, sophisticated puppet uh, I've, I've ever come across. Um, but it's soft design, um, and this is a, a technique that we, uh, we write about in the article. Um, 
they use, uh, have, have really pioneered this technique, uh, developed new materials of uh, a special um, skin uh, and uh, these muscle bags. And so they have like a strong skeleton, um, well, aluminum skeleton underneath, but um, uh, controlled by servers and, and, and pneumatic actuators. Um, but the texture of the, the robot uh, is quite soft uh, design and soft materials uh, in the approach. Um, the soft design is controlled using a combination of automatic automation, uh, what uh, a technique that CTC calls voodoo puppeteering, and direct manipulation puppetry, which you uh, just saw how all of these kind of hybrid control systems work in concert with one another. Uh, and the direct manipulation is inspired directly by uh, marionettes, as we see from the, the chords, but also from the bunraku uh, uh, Japanese rod puppetry. Ten puppeteers operate the robot's limbs on stage by manipulating ropes attached to the body. Um, you saw the turntable that they're attached to. Uh, and at other times on stage, the operators are directly manipulating the robot, uh, the puppet, using rods hidden inside the puppet hands. Uh, what's interesting to me is I see this as a human-robot interaction problem. So uh, we've talked a lot about how uh, designers um, and uh, artists and puppeteers uh, and uh, folks are thinking through the materials or figuring out what can this material do, uh, or as uh, Ed uh, said, you know, Christopher Donovan, thinking about what is the machine telling you, how do it wants to move. Um, that's true and here, except you have 13 operators thinking through the material and in concert with one another. Uh, and they are physically separated. So think about it, there are 10 puppeteers on stage, there are three in the back of the house, and you're also coordinating with uh, some automation. Uh, it's, 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 an, it's a problem, I think, that, uh, and, and the, that I think um, folks who work in advanced human-in-the-loop systems uh, could look at this for a model of how you design systems that facilitate that fluid human-human robot uh, interaction. Um, towards a, a, a single goal. Um, so finishing up, because I heard my uh, timer. I have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Oh, do I? Okay. Well, um, so we saw here in this clip from uh, from um, King Kong that uh, you know we can actually watch the puppeteers kind of powering the movement, right? Um, and we see the athleticism and the agility of their motions. Uh, and in Kong, it works, right? In live stage performance, uh, it, it can work, um, providing a convaling illusion of an autonomous puppet, um, even when the operators are in full view, getting back to this uh, phenomenal um, double vision. Um, but rather than disguise or mask the puppet factor, uh, the human operators are incorporated into the performance uh, aesthetics. And uh, I think ultimately this choice, um, capitalizing on, on what machines do well and on what the uh, programmed automation and the sensing can do well, um, but also uh, in acknowledging what the humans, the kind of motions that humans can produce, uh, human puppeteers. So when robots appear on stage, the audience has a very similar expectation for the robot uh, as for a human performer or a puppet. They expect the robot to be expressive and responsive to the environment, to the other characters, and uh, hopefully to the audience. Expressivity and responsiveness are the keys to creating the illusion of autonomy. Whether or not the object looks realistic, and even if the operators are in full or partial view. That puppetry, I think we can all agree by now, has a rich history of, uh, of approaches uh, to creating expressive movement that create this illusion using very simple means. Uh, they know how to leverage soft design, uh, they know how to leverage uh, and, and turn uh, the constraint of imprecise control into their advantage and, uh, and to really work with materials. Uh, it's interesting, all of the engineers I m met with at CTC, uh, when I looked at their, the design and, and, and talked to them about how they created the movements uh, uh, and for their, their massive robots, um, they all said the same thing. Listen to the material. The material is going to tell you where it wants to go and what it wants to do. And so there's a lot of experimentation that happens uh, with materials. Now, the world of puppetry and engineering, I think, to me, are obviously very close. Um, but typically, they don't intermingle. And the other thing that I'm realizing in my work, too, is I have one foot kind of in the research world and one foot in the arts world, is um, those worlds often don't talk to one another. Um, and there are, are a couple of reasons for this, probably many. Uh, and 
you know, typically engineers, uh, from a research perspective, can perhaps regard the work of puppeteers as gossamer or frivolous or, or maybe not uh, robust. And artists are, I think, naturally and understandably resistant to the idea of uh, any attempts um, at mechanization of their uh, artistic practices that are cultivated over a lifetime. Um, but the more we can get <laughs> these groups talking to one another and see that actually uh, not only are we uh, in live theater uh, when, when we've got robots on stage, not only are we, um, is that a site for understanding how humans relate to robots, we're actually modeling very advanced uh, uh, engineering problems and coming up with design solutions. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to articulate in my research. Um, yeah. So I, I think this approach of incorporating puppetry into the design of robots and control systems uh, from an aesthetic standpoint uh, allows robots to transcend, uh, even if only momentarily, their status as mechanical objects and inquire a acquire a perceived autonomy or special kind of life. And I'll finish there, thank you. <laughs>